Hi, I'm John Williams. I'm a spine surgeon in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and I'm going to talk to you for a few minutes today about the OLIF approach to addressing lumbar pathology. This is a talk for spine surgeons that are looking to develop in their practice and see their practice evolve into a more minimally invasive approach to accomplish what we're already accomplishing with the traditional open ALIF procedure. So I'm gonna to refer to this model some, which is a model that as spine practitioners we're, we're well used to as a sawbones model. Um, and, I, and I'll tell you up front, an, an easy transition is to move from being a direct lateral or trans surgeon to being an OLIF or oblique anterior surgeon. Uh, remember, OLIF stands for oblique lumbar inner body fusion. It's a, a synthesis of traditional ALIF surgery and trans direct lateral surgery. It really, it marries or combines all the benefits of one and the, the advantages of the other. Specifically, we're talking about a trajectory that moves into the inner body space just anterior to the psoas and just lateral to the great vessels. You can approach the spine obliquely, either right or left-sided, but traditionally, and what we're teaching right now, is to approach the spine from the patient's left side. The reason for this is that when you do so, you face the aorta, which is far less likely to be injured than is the inferior vena cava. The other advantage of, of approaching the patient from the left side from a vascular standpoint is that the aorta has a pulse. It's very easy to palpate, whereas the vena cava is very difficult to palpate, uh, just for that, the fact that it doesn't have a muscular wall and it doesn't have a pulse. So for now, we're gonna focus on left-sided approach. There is a corridor between where the aorta sits, where the aorta lies, and the psoas, and, and that little oblique corridor is, is the one we're gonna to work to enter, starting with the skin incision, carrying that dissection down through the abdominal wall, and then developing the retroperitoneal space, and finally, docking a retractor onto the spine to safely get into the disc space and perform your disc prep, disc removal, end plate preparation, uh, implant spacer replacement, and then bone graft in order to accomplish a fusion. Maybe before we talk about the approach itself, let's just talk some specifics about the advantages. When we do traditional supine ALIF surgery, you're addressing the spine uh, head on. What that means is you have to mobilize the great vessels out of the way. You actually, we place retractors on the great vessels and move them aside. With OLIF surgery, we leave the great vessels right where they are and we don't mobilize them. Also with supine ALIF surgery, the patient's lying on their back. So the peritoneal contents are pushed by gravity down, wrapping up the spine. But when we turn the patient into the lateral decubitus position, gravity works with us and gravity pulls the peritoneal contents out of our surgical field and out of harm's way. So what does that mean? That means when we're doing anterior inner body work from an oblique approach, we're doing less peritoneal dissection, less peritoneal retraction, thereby less potential visceral injury or injury to the peritoneal contents. When we compare oblique surgery to trans psoas surgery, they're, they're very similar. I mean, with anterior to the psoas surgery, you're only moving your dissection about two or three centimeters anterior to get to the anterior margin of the psoas. But just those two or three centimeters make a dramatic difference in two simple ways. One is we remove the lumbar plexus uh, out of harm's way. By going to the anterior psoas and gently sweeping the anterior psoas off the spine, mobilizing it posteriorly, we mobilize the lumbar plexus with this and we avoid injury to the plexus, injuries that we do see when we work in a trans psoas or direct lateral fashion. The other upside of oblique surgery over direct lateral surgery is that the, the surgeon stands anterior to the patient. When you're looking at the spine, you can actually look posteriorly into the disc space and really get a good 
posterior decompression, removing all the disc from the back of the inner body space and even taking a small angled curette and passing it into the neuroforamen. You can remove the posterior longitudinal ligament, remove the posterior annulus, just like you would in an anterior cervical discectomy and decompression. So that's, that's one thing that we cannot do. When we work, when we work direct lateral, when, when we go trans psoas and work direct lateral, we don't have access or vision to look back into the disc space. I'm going to take this from the standpoint of a surgeon who is a direct lateral surgeon who wants to evolve his practice into working in the oblique space. You know, there's a long list of reasons why to do this, guys. So all of you guys that are out there that have done 100 or 200 trans surgeries, you know that one of the things we ignore is L5-S1 pathology. One of the ways that we can address L5-S1 is by developing our skills uh, in, in uh, approaching the spine from an oblique approach. So let's, let's talk about that approach specifically, and then we'll talk, we'll talk a little bit more about L5-S1, because that, certainly that is the, the holy grail of this operation. That's where you actually can, can address pathology that, that, that we're kind of used to ignoring uh, as trans psoas surgeons. The way we begin is placing the patient on their side, very similar to preparing a, pac a patient for a direct lateral uh, fusion surgery. Now, with trans psoas surgery, we flex the hips and flex the knees in order to relax the psoas and relax the lumbar plexus. We take a little bit different approach with the oblique approach. Now, in, in this case, we want to position the patient on their side with the hips and knees fully extended. This does several things for us. Number one, it puts the psoas under tension moving it posteriorly. That increases the corridor between the psoas and the aorta. The other thing it does when we extend the hips and extend the knees is we add lordosis to the spine. So in terms of sagittal correction and making a degenerative uh, uh, hypolordotic spine more lordotic, we do that just by positioning the patient on the table. Another significant advantage to keeping the hips and the knees extended as we position the patient is that it allows easy access into the L5-S1 corridor. And so you're going to hear me say that over and over again, maintaining the trajectory into a disc space. The, 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 the truer the trajectory into the disc space from an oblique approach, the less soft tissue dissection you're forced to do and the easier access you have with the instruments that you use. And we're going to talk specifically about instruments because this, in this situation, camber spine has really developed a cadre of specific instruments to allow you to safely get into the inner body disc space, whether it's at L5-S1 or up higher, L2-3, L3-4, and L4-5, in order to do what you want to do safely and effectively. So, patients in the lateral decubitus position, securely taped to the bed, Fluoroscopy is brought into play. We get an AP lumbar film to make sure that the patient's positioned in neutral rotation. Then we swing to a lateral view. In the lateral view, we're gonna mark the trajectories of the target discs. So let's, for example, let's say we're gonna focus on L45 and L5S1. We're gonna mark the anterior spine and the trajectory of L45, and we're gonna do the same thing at L5S1. We're gonna mark that on the skin here, lateral, and then a direct line in the trajectory of that disc space, anteriorly, tells us where we wanna put our fascial incision on the abdomen. The inguinal ligament carries on from here. So here's the ilioinguinal nerve, and just in front of that's the iliohypogastric nerve. So we're gonna make our skin incision a good two finger breaths anterior to the ASIS to ensure that we avoid those sensory nerves. And looking at the trajectory of our disc space at L5-S1 gives us a good idea of where we want to make our fascial incision. We want to make our fascial incision in such a spot that we can go straight back into that disc space and get a good posterior decompression. It's surgeon preference. You can make separate small skin incisions for each disc that's removed and replaced. Or you can make, uh, if you're doing two discs, a single oblique skin incision and then two separate fascial incisions to get into two different discs. As surgeons, we're all looking for the same thing. We're looking for better outcomes for our patients and doing it in a way that minimizes their, the morbidity the patient has to face to achieve that result. 
In this procedure, the oblique lumbar inner body fusion procedure is one way that you can achieve that as a surgeon. I would certainly encourage you to begin at L4-5 and L3-4 when you're comfortable in that space and you're ready to move to the L5-S1 level, so get some help. You can um, access this video, ask, uh, you can contact me directly, and you do that through Camber Spine. There, that's a company that's committed to your education, helping you do what you do better uh, in the operating room. And, and uh, I promise you, your patients will thank you for it. Hope you found this helpful.